Today, I'm gonna to have the pleasure of introducing Elizabeth and Paul Kaiser to you today. Before we get into that, I just wanted to share something really briefly with you. I'm also part of Eco Camp Coyote. We're part of the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Movement in California. Um, uh, hopefully you can see this graphic right now. We're gonna be having a Zoom event next weekend. It's gonna be writing off a lot of things you're learning about at Soil Not Oil this weekend. Um, land stewardship, we've got a big nursery out there we're working on, um, working on increasing our soil organic matter and all these things like Paul and Elizabeth are gonna be talking about and also a strong focus on post petroleum technologies and fossil free food systems. So um, check it out. I'm gonna put the link in the bio or in the chat in the room briefly. Um, it's a free event, so hop in if you can. All right, moving along. Um, so Paul and Elizabeth Kaiser, you may have heard of them. They're the owners of Singing Frog Farms in Northern California. It's a very well-known no-till ecological farm. They've done amazing things in increase, increasing their soil organic matter. Um, they're great speakers and educators and have educated a whole generation of younger farmers in the ways that they're doing there. And yeah, it's a great family owned farm and we're really happy to have them here today. They're gonna to be talking about their farming systems and the importance of small scale regenerative vegetable growing in times of crisis and change. So before we see them, we're gonna have a quick video, get to see the beauty of their farm. And then they're gonna give a talk and hopefully we'll have a little time for Q and A at the end. So thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you on the other side. A little bit about Singing Frogs Farm and where we are in, in place. Uh, we have an eight and a half acre property. It's shaped like a long triangle, like a long piece of pizza, and you're just looking right down that behind us right now. We have been here since 2007. We have expanded and changed very much while we've been farming. About 45% of our produce goes to our CSA. We love our CSA. It's year round and just has a really close connection with our members that are our eaters. About 45% of our produce also goes to farmer's market customers. Again, that close connection with our eaters. And then the last 10% goes to restaurants. Aside from produce, we've had a wonderful no-till flower aspect. So today's bouquet, I'm gonna be doing kind of a that 70s bouquet theme. Oh, you're gonna do it? Yeah. Nice. So regenerative agriculture really focuses on the soil and we like to frame it within the principles of soil management, which are actually put together by uh, the USDA. On our farm, we do absolutely no tillage and the only disturbing the soil that we might do is putting our hand in to transplant a new plant. The act of tilling breaks up your soil aggregates in the smaller and smaller particle sizes, releases two of the most potent greenhouse gases. We want to have as much photosynthesis and as much feeding the soil as possible. We have over 90 varieties of vegetables plus another 90 varieties of flowers that we grow on the farm. Every bed has something different. Having that diversity is what's really important to us, both for creating a healthy diet for our CSA and farmers market customers, as well as for the soil. Ideally, the way you want to protect soil and keep it covered is with green living plants. Anywhere from 20 to 60% of those carbon-based products of photosynthesis are not used by the plant for its own growth and development, but pushed down into the soil to feed the biology. And that is how we increased our soil organic matter on this farm from about 2.4% to over 11% in about six years. Mother Nature did not separate her plants and her animals. She had them together. And we need to do the same if we're gonna have healthy soil. And we're bringing these goats down over to a pasture with some redwoods because 
to munch, munch, munch. <laughs> We are encouraging so much life. You hear birds singing, we've got bobcats, we've got hawks, all sorts of life that we're having there. And that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is we definitely bring in manures vis-a-vis -vis our compost. A large portion of that is manures from different kinds of animals that has been composted and then is applied to bring those nutrients back to the soil and help with those plants. Yeah. Seeing the produce and the way it grows is just a sign of the care and keeping of the soil that's at the heart of this farm. By the very act of farming, we're making our soil better. We're increasing the overall health and vitality of the ecosystem in which we're farming. That has been our goal all along. Fantastic. Thank you so much again, Soil Not Oil, for having us on. Um, and a big thank you also to the Bay Area Green Tours for helping create that wonderful introductory video that we just saw. Um, Paul and myself, we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of small scale regenerative vegetable production during crisis and change, something we all know a little bit about during this global pandemic. Um, small farms can epitomize resilience, especially in contrast to modern industrialized agriculture, which has been one of the largest destructive forces on our planet this century. And I know that a lot of the other speakers this morning have really spoken to that. Uh, small farms also create more resilient communities and localized food distribution networks, which honestly for a farmer just means feeding your neighbors. Whereas industrialized farms are stuck within an inflexible and therefore vulnerable supply chain that functions primarily because it is propped up by governments and corporations and is built on extraction and de degeneration rather than regeneration, what we want. This is especially poignant in the midst of a COVID pandemic, but also in relation to the constant climate crises that we're facing this decade and beyond. Innovative farming practices that benefit the below ground ecology of the soil, the above ground ecology, and the communities in which they grow food represent the future of regenerative agriculture. This regenerative approach to food production makes us more resilient, more flexible, and helps us to work along with Mother Nature rather than against her which allows us and Mother Nature to thrive together as best we can, and even to make a difference in reversing climate change. So let's start by talking about the soil. We're gonna leave you right now and we're gonna put on um, a presentation. Um, we'll come back at, towards the end. So um, again, the importance of small scale regenerative vegetable farming during crisis and change, and starting off with soil. Um, so soil, Soil is really composed primarily of air, water, uh, and mineral particles. The last tiny little bit of it is what's known as soil organic matter, and that's really where we're going to focus today because that's where the life is. Um, and every planet in the universe actually has chemistry, but our planet, Earth, is one of the few that has life, and that's really what makes us so special, and that's where we need to focus on. Um, so taking soil and the importance of soil organic matter, it's important to look at the history of agriculture and how that impacts soil. Tillage, this is a quote from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, but tillage is one of the most, the major practices that reduces the organic matter level in the soil. This is not, um, this is complete, science understands this. This is a very clear um, results. And another quote that I love from the USDA, Tilling the soil is the equivalent of an earthquake, hurricane, tornado, and forest fire occurring simultaneously to the world of soil organisms. Simply stated, tillage is bad for the soil. And to think about how tillage is bad for soil, there's two things going on here. I actually want to go back briefly. The first way that it reduces organic matter level in the soil is to, when you're blending up and tilling and churning the soil with equipment like this picture, you are reducing the aggregate size of each soil particle and therefore increasing the overall exposure of that soil, part soil particle to oxygen. Plus the whole active tillage brings oxygen into the soil. So what you end up with is a release of nitrogen and carbon that com from the soil, it combines with oxygen and forms nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide, two of the most potent greenhouse gases. And yet as a farmer, the two things we need most in our soil are nitrogen and carbon. 
and looking at how tillage affects biology, um, tillage not only blends up the biology itself, but it also blends up and churns the entire ecosystem that the biology relies on for life. So tillage not only affects the carbon and nitrogen in soil, it also dramatically impacts the overall ability for biology to thrive in the soil. And this is clear from results of studies showing how pre-cultivation topsoils, healthy agricultural topsoils before humans begin cultivating for food, usually have a six to 10% soil organic matter, SOM, soil organic matter. However, topsoils around the planet today are between zero and 3% soil organic matter. We've had a dramatic decrease in the overall organic matter of our agricultural soils. And where we live in California, in fact, our average agricultural topsoils, as of four years ago, were only at a 1% soil organic matter, just 1%. Now on our farm, as we have tra transitioned from doing tillage, which yes, we did do full organic tillage our first couple of years, to no-till, we very quickly built up that soil organic matter so that you can see in this picture here, a picture of very non-productive soil back in 2007, 2008, when our soil organic matter was 2.4%. Up until 2013 to the current time, our soil organic matter, depending on the field, is 8 to 11%. So that's a soil carbon of 4.6 to 6.5%. And now we measure that pretty deep. We measure that down where the roots are at 6 to 12 inches. Um, why is the soil organic matter important? There's several things, but a lot of it lies upon just the soil structure. Um, higher soil organic matter means that you've got better soil structure. This means you can have a, ra a good aeration, uh, provide habitat for your biology. And the photo that you're seeing in the background will come to again later. Um, this is a picture of soil from uh, about 20 meters off of our fence line in our neighbor's tillage-based perennial crop versus soil from our no-till annual crops that was taken in uh, August, so the end of our dry season. You can see a huge difference here of roots, soil structure of all of it being held together. Um, another reason that soil organic matter provides food and also the ecosystem for the microorganisms living in the soil so that they can live there, they can thrive there, um, and they can therefore help the plants. And since you are building up the microorganisms and the soil food web, um, you have a decrease in pest insects because you're bringing balance to that ecosystem, which is super important. Uh, next, it in just generally increases soil fertility and crop nutrient density. So it improves, you know, the, your nutrient availability. Um, but as you have more nutrient dense soil, you're obviously going to have more nutrient dense crops, which is important for us. And with that increased plant immune system with higher levels of polyphenols and so forth. The plants have that to fight disease. Well, guess what? When we eat those or when the animals eat those, they then have higher levels of polyphenols and a higher immune system. Um, lastly, um, that soil is going to act like a sponge. It's going to retain better water when you have uh, times of drought. And when you have times of too much water, it's also going to hold the air in the soil so that you have soil resilience. We're going to talk about this a little bit later since in our area we have a lot of either drought or floods. Um, lastly, um, soil organic matter, it's 57% carbon. It's the world's largest carbon sink. It's where we need the carbon. We need it to work for us, um, work in concert with Mother Nature. So let's talk a little bit about how. Um, we talk about the principles of soil health, as was briefly mentioned in the video, but we're going to go a little more into detail. The USDA has a standard five principles of better soil management. These five principles actually are quite universal. It isn't just the USDA. It's many agricultural organizations around the world, including FAO and others. And they are, number one, disturb the soil as little as possible. Two, keep living plants in the soil as often as possible. Three, grow as many different species of plants as practical. Four, keep the soil covered all the time. And five, incorporate animals. 
We want to go through these one at a time and see how we apply um, these principles in our everyday management of our small scale intensive and no-till regenerative farm. And the first one, of course, will be number one, disturb the soil as little as possible. And again, these are two soil samples that we took about 100 yards apart or 80, 100 meters apart. Um, so same soil originally. In fact, our soil looked like that soil on the left originally. But today, after doing no-till and following the five principles of better soil health, we have created a far more robust, healthy, alive, and biologically active soil with aggregates and roots and structure and the ability to hold water and the ability to resist erosion, both wind and water erosion. Um, you can also see that this is the, the white part in the middle of the picture is the cut stem of a recently harvested, harvested lettuce or escarole. And you can see all of the earthworms abundant in that soil around it. It's really critical to understand how much life can thrive around the base of a plant, and therefore you don't want to disturb that soil after that plant has been there. That, so, that plant has shaded and protected the soil, created this relationship between the biology and the soil and the plant where they exchange nutrients, and therefore you absolutely want to make sure that once that plant is harvested, do not disturb the soil, do not till it, do not blend it up, but rather help that life to thrive by continuing to plant more plants there. Number two, is keep living plants in the soil as often as possible. And this is really part of the answer to, you know, the climate problems that we're having, drawing down that carbon out of the atmosphere and into the soil. A lot of people talk about that, but this is the mechanism. It's not something fancy out of Silicon Valley. It's photosynthesis. It's what happens in our plants every single day that the sun is shining. So first and foremost, you've got photosynthesis. You've got those green leaves. Uh, taking in sunlight, taking in CO2, taking water and nutrients from the roots, and creating glucose, your most basic building block of life, carbon-based life. Then the plant resynthesizes that into a myriad of other carbon-based products, more complicated sugars and carbohydrates, uh, amino acids, proteins, fats, waxes, so forth and so on. Now the exciting part is number three, exudation, whereby anywhere from 20 to 60% of those products of photosynthesis are not actually used by the plant for its own growth and development, but pushed down through the soil to feed the biology. Now, the plants aren't trying to fight, fight climate change for us silly humans that have put all the carbon up in the air. They're trying to uh, enhance the symbiotic relationships with the biology, first the fungi and the bacteria, and then those in turn feed the entire soil food web and that building that food web is really the humification the building of humus the building of that soil organic matter and all of that life um i hope that you can see this video um right now our web connection isn't the best this is in a petri dish and what you're seeing here liquid sun roots exudating this is a root hair pushing out those liquid carbon-based products of photosynthesis into the soil to feed the organisms. The organisms in the soil, the primary way that they're getting their food is through photosynthesis. Even if they live underground, um, uh, we need photosynthesis to live. On our farm, uh, we make that happen by constantly having young new plants, economic plants. Every bed on our farm will have three to eight sequential economic crops in any one bed over a 12-month cycle. Now, they, of course, cover crops, but economic cover crops. So that might be bok choy, that might be favas, that might be uh, tomatoes, that might be peppers, that might be Brussels sprouts and broccoli. All of those different crops we're going to rotate. Through. And it's important to think of all of those crops, all of our economic vegetable crops, as cover crops. They are. They are cover crops, and they happen to be our vegetables. And we think of them as such so that we can manage our soil in a way that helps build that soil biology, build soil health, build soil resiliency. And as a small farm, we get to be intensive so that we can manage each bed that way, um, and we can manage so many different crops going through there. It's also important to grow as many different species of plants as practical. You want diversity of root exudations to feed a diversity of soil biology to really create the optimal health conditions for your soil biology to thrive. And in addition to having crop diversity, that also equates to climate resiliency, 
as well as economic resiliency. And it's true that on our farm, we have crop failures every single year. And every year those crop failures are different. Some years we have a massive hit of a late frost that wipes out half our tomato crop. Other years we have deep floods that end up wiping out all of our winter brassicas. We have all kinds of different struggles and crop losses. And despite that, every single year, our revenue continues to increase by five or 10 or 15%. Every single year, it's continually going upwards. So even though we might lose entire crops, we have so much crop diversity that it creates economic resiliency and climatic resiliency. It really helps to ensure that we're going to have many, many crops succeed, even when some don't succeed. One other way we can really implement crop diversity besides growing 100 different species of vegetables and herbs and flowers is actually starting to grow crops together in ways that co-benefit. So here we have much larger kale, uh, cauliflower plants. These are our Romanesco cauliflower with lettuces in between. The bright light green lettuces are in between. Those Romanesco cauliflower plants really only need a two lines in a bed with 24 inch spacing. And to have 24 inch spacing with two lines means you have a lot of bare soil left over afterwards. Therefore, we decided to put lettuce in between to help cover that bare soil. And this photograph is really only about two and a half weeks or three weeks after transplanting. They were very large transplants. And already you can see that most of the soil is getting covered and protected from sun and wind to create better growing conditions for the biology. It also means less irrigation is needed because you're protecting your soil and you're not losing moisture to the air. And best of all, as these crops begin to grow together, the cauliflower is providing a little bit of light shade and light windbreak to the lettuce, creating better optimal growing conditions for the lettuce. Meanwhile, the lettuce is helping to suppress weeds so that when finally the cauliflower begins to close canopy and leaves from different plants touch, that's the time the lettuce gets harvested and removed, at which point you've just harvested a 70% bed of lettuce, and now you have the cauliflower filling in and growing to a 100% crop of cauliflower over the next month. So you end up with 1.7 crops in a bed at the same time that co-benefit each other, reduce the need for weeding, reduce the need for irrigation, increase soil biology, increase root exudation, and increase overall soil health and crop health both. We like to do these kinds of co-plantings with tomatoes as well. Tomatoes often from transplant to first harvest take about three months. In those three months, we can do all kinds of shoulder crops, including red butterhead lettuces or escarols or basil. And we can often get two crops of a shoulder crop while waiting for the tomatoes to come to their first harvest. Another crop that we really enjoyed co-planting with was uh, broccoli and fava beans. And broccoli tends to not support the fungal colonies in soil as well as other vegetables. And we were concerned that by growing broccoli and cauliflower frequently that we weren't supporting the fungal colonies in the soil from the crop before the broccoli until the crop after the broccoli. That three months of broccoli would, de would degrade our fungal content in the soil. So we decided to interplant it with fava beans and favas definitely support the fungal colonies in the soil. And the fava beans themselves are not just a harvest for the bean, but you can harvest the plants young as tender shoots of greens. And so the picture on the right is the harvested fava greens bunched and ready to go to market. And so again, we're getting an economic crop of fava greens in between the cauliflower and broccoli plants at the same time. And those fava plants, they're fantastic at maintaining the fungal colonies in the soil, as well as being a nitrogen fixing plant. This is a fava plant that's only about four weeks from germination, and you can already see the nitrogen nodules um, on the roots helping to create more of a nitrogen, nitrogen um, root ex or exudate nitrogen. Increasing the level of nitrogen in, in the, the soil, soil naturally. <laughs> uh, in addition, more crop diversity can be done with not just your uh, economic annuals, but it can also be done with perennials, specifically hedgerows, or even fruit trees and ground covers in bed ends and in the roadways between fields. We'll get into hedgerows a little bit more later, but for now, just know that having diversity on the farm doesn't just mean the specific economic crops you grow. It also means the roadways that are covered in grasses and clovers and other herbs, as well as hedgerows that can be installed and bed ends, fruit trees, other things you can bring in to create that diversity so that you have resiliency and also have good root exudation uh, diversity of root exodus as well. 
The next uh, principle is keeping the soil covered all the time. And ideally that is with green photosynthesizing plants. But as we are, you know, harvesting a lot, taking plants out and getting the next ones in, um, it often means um, having, having alternates. One of the things we do on our farm is we use very large and healthy transplants rather than s putting direct seeds. Now this means we spend a lot of time on our nursery, which you can see in the background here, but it also means that we can go from a standing photosynthesizing plant to another standing photosynthesizing plant, all by much smaller uh, in, the, in a matter of hours. So we're keeping the soil covered with green plants as much as possible. Um, when we do need to do direct seeding, um, say with carrots, um, we will actually use a burlap over the soil once we have done the seeding. It helps maintain the moisture, it helps maintain the temperature in the soil and reduce uh, the oxidation of the chemicals in the soil. Um, so having as much green cover as possible, our hedgerows, our plants, very, very important. This is just a fun slide to show another benefit of hedgerows providing shade uh, not only for the plants, not only for the roadways, but also for people on a hot, hot day. And the last thing is to incorporate animals into your farming systems. And we like to think outside the livestock box. In fact, there's many other definitions of animals besides cows, goats, and sheep. And it's important to remember that if you're growing a healthy above ground ecology, including with hedgerows, and you're not tilling, then you're going to be encouraging large populations of beneficial um, animals and insects like songbirds and snakes and um, and then all the insect life as well especially beneficial insects including pollinators and also including the ones that hunt pest insects so hedgerows become this wonderful um, breeding ground to help start bringing animals into your farming systems An example of some of what we have in our hedgerows um, hedgerows can also honestly they do help benefit um, your climatic stability in the farm fields. But the real critical part here is bringing animals into your system. So the other way we can bring animals into the system is obviously through our compost piles. We bring in animal manures, either from our own uh, sheep or our own chickens, or we have neighbors who have organically fed horses. And we can bring in their manures and mix it in with our compost piles to bring in the presence of animals into our farm through compost as well. So we have both the above ground presence of all sorts of native wildlife and insects, as well as the addition of composts and manures, manures through the compost. So just wrapping up again, the, the principles of soil management that we go by. Um, before we transition to the next quick session, I just wanted to mention if you want to, if you have any questions or thoughts or want us to address maybe, a, you know, something in your uh, ecosystem, throw it in the chat or in the Q&A and um, we'll work it in if we can and if not, um, maybe answer it towards the end. Um, but uh, what we wanted to do is show you sort of the, the meat and potatoes of what that looks like on our farm. Obviously growing green plants and so forth, but how do we manage moving from one crop to the next? Um, we'll clear the beds. We are not doing any tillage of any sort. Um, we are cutting at the soil surface. Um, occasionally we might broad fork uh, on our farm. That's a, less than 2% of our bed transitions at this point. Um, we might add some fertilizers, organic fertilizers or compost. Um, and then we're gonna transplant the next crop and then we're gonna water and cover in uh, and let those plants do what they do, grow. Um, and um, yeah. uh, we are going to try and show you a video of what this looks like. It doesn't work in the PowerPoint. So let's try it here. Um, and this is a, a stop motion video going from one crop to the next crop in a matter of 45 minutes. So these are four beds. These four beds are about 70 feet long. Uh, and this took about 45 minutes, is that right? Yep. Um, for three people. So they're cutting out the plants that were there before. Uh, there was some cauliflower that had been harvested and uh, some mustards that had flowered. There's a light layer of some uh, calcium oyster shell and a little bit of chicken feather meal, uh, followed by a layer of compost. It looks like a lot here, but it's partially just a change in color. They're immediately going to transplanting, need a bit of a coffee break in between. Um, you have got a uh, interplanting of a brassica here, 
as well as a lettuce in between. So you've actually got two crops happening at the same time. The lettuces will come out first as the cauliflowers are growing and they get watered in and then they are done. And we walk away from it, let those plants grow um, as we do our next bed transitions. So hope that can give you a little bit of a idea of what that looks like. Um, and so the carbon and biology that was nurtured through the prior crops without any soil disturbance helps the next crops thrive. And so as such, we're going to move through our three to eight different successions of crops per year in those beds. Um, also important to note, it looks like a lot of compost application. It's, huge, it's actually about a quarter of an inch. Um, and some people have said, hey, that's where your soil organic matter has come from. But we've done some calculations and we find that that can only account for about 25% of our increases in our soil organic matter. Um, most of that compost is really just feeding the microbiology that's there. 75% of the increase in our soil organic matter is accountable to those five principles of soil health that we just talked about. So this wraps it up into the tenets of seeing frogs' farming model, which is being no-till and disturbing that soil as little as possible, being very intensive and diverse, as well as a very much ecological focus, both above ground and below ground, highly critical. Now I want to take a few minutes right now to talk about how we have faced with our farming system some of these real strong climate crises and challenges. And here in our region, um, as a small-scale regenerative agricultural farm, we have faced constantly fires and floods. Those are two of the biggest challenges in our region. And the challenge posed by fire and flood is increasing dramatically every year due to climate change. I mean, naturally, we have fires and we have fluctuations in water. They've just been amplified um, with climate change. And science has certainly proven what we've now personally witnessed and experienced here at Singing Frogs Farm. And that is that the resiliency our farm has shown in each and every extreme weather event came from one, our healthy carbon rich and biologically active soil, our bounteous and diverse above ground ecology, our flexibility in managing our farming operations, and our close connection with our community, the people for whom we grow food. So these are really sci scientifically proven principles that help with resiliency against extreme weather events. And we have seen it happening here on our farm repeatedly, to which we are thrilled. So one example has actually been the fires that we've been seeing almost every single year in the past three years, the Tubbs, Camp, and Kincaid fires of the past three years. Now, even leading up to the fires, before the fires happened, there were often three or four or five days of desiccating winds and temperature swings of up to 60 degrees Fahrenheit between morning and evening and afternoon, i.e. we wake up in the morning and be below freezing and by two o'clock in the afternoon, it would be over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, um, almost 32, 31 degrees centigrade. So the amount of extreme weather we had even before the fires began was normally crippling to crops and soil biology. And then during the fires, they often are two weeks of really heavy smoke with no sunlight, deep freezes and no power and no water for irrigation. So these Crippling fires have been a real challenge for us, and yet, because of our investment in our soil biology and investing in really healthy soil and regenerative practices, we have weathered these events really well in the past few years. In fact, one thing that we found this past um, fire was even though we lost many thousands of dollars of young brassica crops that had been intended for winter harvests, but they perished honestly under those desiccating winds and temperature fluctuations before the fire even began. But despite those losses, our soil biology and soil organic matter really helped create resiliency amongst all the other crops. And within four to eight weeks later, we had our strongest December sales ever. Um, Eight to 12 weeks later after that, we had our January, best January sales ever. So we still had really good fire management, um, really good resiliency despite those fires. I wanna get into small scale. Great, I just wanted to touch really briefly on small scale farms. Um, 
uh, when the importance of them. This is a chart that uh, I took from a detailed report from the ETC who will feed us the peasant food web versus the industrialized food chain. Just really want to talk about the importance of small farmers in this world where we have so many large scale industrial farmers. Um, if you go down to the bottom of this and start from the bottom on the right, the, the biggest takeaway that I think we can point to is 70% of the world's food is produced by smallholders. This means people on under two acres. Um, and I think this is really poignant as we have so much policy pushing towards those larger scale industrial farms. At the same time, these small farms are only using 20% of the natural resources. 43% um, of those farmers are women and they're using over 2 million different types of varieties versus the industrial farmers are using 80,000. Um, to put that into play and look at our own farm in our community um, and how we work with that, yes, we're in the United States where mostly we're surrounded by industrial, but we're only farming on two and a half acres. Uh, it's a larger eight acre property. Um, we're bringing in $145,000 of revenue per field on a normal year. Now, interesting with COVID, this has actually increased and I was hoping to have a little bit of time to talk about that. Um, it's increased 20% as our local communities have really been excited to have local food from small farms. Um, we've heard a lot about the bigger farms. Oh, farming is having a really hard time. That milk is being dumped, yet food isn't getting to people, and there's you know doubled the demand at food banks and things like that. Um, but what we need to do, we need to have smaller farms, closer communities, and shortening that food chain. I love this infographic. Um, I mean, the most ideal is feeding yourself and having a home garden, but the next is having a really close relationship with a farmer where they're growing and they're bringing it to you, or they're taking it to a farmer's market, but not taking it into transportation and packaging and distribution and so forth. Um, so on our farm during COVID, we have found huge increases, double and sometimes triple the interest that we're not able to um, manifest uh, people wanting our food, knowing that it's safe and knowing that it's local. And this isn't some miracle of Singing Frog's Farm. I've talked to farmers um, from Bangalore in India, from Hawaii and uh, Pacific Island, um, from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. And they're all saying the same. They're saying, we're trying to decrease the steps in our food chain. We're trying to link with smaller scale farmers um, and the small scale farmers are are finally having a moment where they're thriving. Farmers are telling me for the first time they feel really empowered. Um, so I hope you can, um, uh, see with us. Uh, this is an overhead shot of our farm. Um, we feel that all of this is together, taking care of the soil so that we can um, not only sequester the carbon, but also so that we can um, weather these strong um, climate events and crises that are thrown at us and being small so that we can be flexible, we can be innovative, we can be there with our community. Um, I really think that this is what's far, what farming is about and that uh, um, we appreciate all of your support. And thank you all. We really appreciate a chance to be here and we appreciate Soil Not Oil for doing all the hard work they do to bring all of us together into this community to share and learn and inspire each other. So thank you all very thank much. Thank you so much, you and, and Elizabeth, and, and thank you. You have been one of the most important speakers for Soil Not All, supporting us every year. And I am so proud of being your friend and visiting your farm and staying in your farm because you are the most amazing farmers in California. <laughs> thank you, Miguel. Thank you so much. <laughs> I will talk with you soon. <laughs>